The air on the jungle floor is thick, heavy with the smell of decay and damp earth. You feel it clinging to your skin before the sun has breached the canopy. A strange stillness holds everything in its grip. But then you see it. A dark, pulsating mass clinging to the underside of a fallen log. A living sphere the size of a bushel basket that seems to breathe. It shimmers, a subtle, chitinous ripple flowing over its surface. This is a body, an entity comprised of half a million individual bodies, locked together in a temporary fortress of flesh. The surface of the bivouac begins to liquefy. What was a solid, interwoven structure dissolves into a cascade of movement. You feel the vibration in the soles of your feet before you hear the sound. A low, electric crackle. The collective rustle of millions of tiny legs meeting the leaf litter. This is not the coordinated awakening of a disciplined army. It is the autonomic response of a single creature. A biological switch is thrown. The superorganism is unfurling. You can now smell it. A sharp, acidic tang that cuts through the jungle's sweetness. It's the scent of total biological warfare. You watch as the larger soldiers, the majors, emerge first. Their oversized mandibles like sharpened shears. They form a living perimeter, not out of bravery or duty, but because their programming demands it. Their bodies are the fortress walls, their heads the ramparts. Inside this living shield, the smaller workers, the nerve endings and muscles of the creature, begin to flow outwards. To call this a society is to project our own world onto something far more alien. The individual is a fantasy, a rounding error in a vast, terrifying equation of collective survival. This is a masterclass in biological totalitarianism, a system so efficient it has no need for dissent, and so unified it has no need for a mind. The march is beginning, and its direction is not a choice, but an inevitability. The river of bodies flows outward, a single, dark tendril probing the forest floor. How does it know which way to go? You search for a leader, a general at the vanguard, but find none. You must tune out the sight of the million, strong column and focus on the individual, on a single worker at the edge of the nascent trail. She presses the tip of her abdomen to a dead leaf, depositing a microscopic droplet of chemicals. It is a single word in a language you cannot speak, this pheromone is not a suggestion, it is a physical law that bends the will of the next ant to encounter it. A modification of the environment that bends the will of the next ant to encounter it. The air becomes a network, a carrier of invisible commands. One scent trail means explore, another, more volatile, screams, attack. While a third, laid down by a dying sister, warns of a threat with an odor that triggers immediate, violent aggression. An ant cannot question the trail. It cannot offer a different opinion. To breathe the pheromone is to obey it. This is a system that has ruthlessly edited free will out of its code, treating it as a fatal bug. As more ants follow the initial path, each one reinforces it adding her own chemical signature to the message. A faint whisper becomes a shout. A shout becomes a deafening roar. A trail leading to barren ground simply evaporates, its explorer lost and forgotten. But a trail leading to prey becomes a superhighway of death within minutes. Its importance amplified by the enthusiasm of thousands. A biological algorithm playing out in real time, a form of emergent intelligence. It mirrors the most efficient and most frightening collectivist systems in human history. Built not on ideology, but on inescapable chemistry, 
the column now fans out, widening from a path into a vast, sweeping front. And the chemical roar is driving the collective into a state of predatory frenzy. The frenzy is now a physical presence on the forest floor. The exploratory tendril has widened into a 50-foot front, a rolling wave of chitin and mandibles that advances with the terrifying inexorability of a tide. The sound is the first thing that overwhelms you. The white noise of millions of legs moving in unison. A sound like a downpour on dry leaves that never ceases. The ground itself seems to boil as the swarm flows over it. A living carpet of relentless hunger. Before this advancing line, the ecosystem panics. Spiders abandon their webs. Scorpions scuttle from their burrows and even sleeping lizards are flushed from their hiding places. It is a localized apocalypse, a systematic deconstruction of life. You witness a tarantula, a fearsome predator in its own world, rise up to defend its territory. It is a futile gesture. The first few ants are dispatched by its fangs, but they are followed by ten more, then a hundred. They swarm its legs, its body, their combined weight and synchronized bites overwhelming it in seconds. You are not watching a battle. You are watching a digestive process that has been externalized. The swarm is the stomach of the superorganism, and anything it touches is simply food. Larger soldiers use their powerful jaws to tear open the nests of other insects their bodies forming living bridges across small gaps in the terrain. The smaller, more numerous workers flood in behind them. A clean-up crew that picks the environment clean. Prey is not merely killed, it is disassembled on the spot. Legs, wings, and heads are clipped off and discarded. The protein, rich torsos are hefted and carried back in a steady stream a conveyor belt of organic matter flowing from the front lines to the colony's heart. The losses to the ants themselves are continuous and ignored. A worker is stung by a wasp, its body convulsing before being trampled by a thousand of its own sisters. There is no pause, no moment of mourning. In some systems, a single life is not just expendable, but utterly irrelevant you turn away from the chaotic front and follow the supply line, a disciplined, two, way river of ants flowing back through the jungle. The frantic energy of the hunt gives way to the steady, rhythmic hum of industry. The returning workers are laden with the dismembered parts of their victims, carrying this morbid harvest back to the heart of the superorganism. Their destination is the structure you witnessed at dawn, the bivouac. From a distance, it appears as a single, static object. But as you draw closer, you see it is in a state of constant, subtle motion. The entire fortress breathes. This is not a city of wood or stone. It is a city of flesh. You watch as individual workers lock their legs together, using hooked claws on their tarsi to form a living, self-assembling chain mail. This fabric of bodies is woven into walls, arches, and chambers, creating a structure that is both incredibly strong and dynamically responsive. The ant colony builds with the living, creating a perfect synthesis of infrastructure and inhabitant. The wall is the citizen, the floor is the populace, to be a part of this structure is the ultimate act of self-annihilation, a load-bearing component. A living brick in a wall of your sisters. Your identity dissolves. Inside this living labyrinth, a carefully controlled environment is maintained. The dense walls of bodies insulate the colony's most precious assets. The vast nurseries of pearlescent larvae and at the very core, the queen. 
the food you saw being carried from the raid is brought here, into the darkness, to be distributed mouth to mouth, fueling the growth of the next generation. The entire structure, this marvel of biological engineering, exists to serve as a temporary, living womb. It is an act of collective devotion that borders on the sublime, yet is rooted in a logic so cold it defies our understanding of sacrifice. To be a pillar of this community is not a metaphor. It is your literal, and perhaps only, purpose. You watch the constant stream of protein flowing into the dark, living architecture of the bivouac. This entire enterprise, the terrifying raid, the intricate living nest, is all in service of a single, unyielding purpose. Fueling the engine of reproduction, the superorganism is a vast, nomadic biomass conversion machine. The jungle floor is its raw material, and new army ants are its only product. The systematic annihilation you witnessed on the swarm front was not an act of malice, but a harvest. The raid is triggered by a collective metabolic signal. When the energy reserves of the colony drop below a certain threshold, the hunting algorithm is initiated. You can no more blame the swarm for its path of destruction than you can blame a river for flooding. It is simply a force of nature, following its own internal, inescapable laws. Its true terror lies not in any imagined evil, but in its profound, cosmic indifference. Sometimes the target is not a lone scorpion or a fleeing beetle, but the society of another insect. The swarm will locate the nest of a rival ant species and inundate it, pushing past the defenders with overwhelming numbers. They are after the ultimate prize, the enemy's young. The chambers are looted of their eggs, larvae, and pupae. This helpless brood, a treasure trove of fat and protein, is hauled back to the bivouac. We apply our own word to this act slavery. But even this is misleading. They are stealing a rival corporation's assets and liquidating its future. It is the purest form of biological economics. A hostile takeover where the only currency is life itself. It forces you to see the jungle not as a community of creatures, but as a brutal marketplace of competing genetic economies you press deeper into the bivouac, moving through tunnels formed from the interlocked bodies of living ants. The air grows warmer, thick with humidity, and a powerful, almost greasy scent that overrides all others. This is the scent of fertility, the chemical signature of the colony's heart. You pass chambers packed with glistening larvae, the future of the colony. Until you arrive at the core, there is no throne room, no court, only an engine room. And at its center is the queen. She is a giant, her body a hundred times the size of her daughter's. Her abdomen a pale, distended sac that pulses with the rhythm of production. She is almost entirely immobile, a biological factory dedicated to a single task laying eggs. An endless, milky stream of them emerges from her body, immediately whisked away by a dedicated retinue of workers who clean her, feed her, and manage the output of her living assembly line. We call her a queen, but this word is a profound fiction. A human queen holds power. This creature does none of those things. A human queen holds power, makes decisions, possesses a will, she is not the colony's brain, she is its ovary. Her powerful pheromones are not commands, but an involuntary chemical broadcast of her physiological state. A signal that holds the million, bodied organism together as a single, cohesive reproductive unit. She is a prisoner on her throne. Her immense, productive body is also her cage, rendering her unable to move. To feed herself, 
to do anything but produce. The most important individual is also the most powerless, a slave to the very biological imperative she embodies. In our world, power is synonymous with freedom. In hers, the pinnacle of importance is a state of absolute bondage. If the queen does not rule, then what does? You look at the unthinking, perfect devotion of the workers around her and realize the truth. The throne is empty. The true ruler is the system itself. The ancient, unwritten algorithm of instinct that flows through every individual. The queen is merely a vital component, a nodal point in the network. But she is no more in charge than a heart is in charge of a body. She is a biological machine, and like every other ant in this colony. She is utterly subservient to the cold, terrifying logic of the whole. The system is the king, the algorithm is the throne. But any system, no matter how perfectly evolved, can have a fatal bug in its code. You turn your attention from the main raiding party to a smaller column that has become detached. Wandering aimlessly, by a fatal accident of geometry, the lead ant loses the primary trail and circles back, crossing its own faint pheromone path. The logic is absolute, you must follow the trail. But now the trail is a circle. You are witnessing the birth of an ant mill, a death spiral. It is a living vortex of biological machinery caught in a fatal feedback loop. The circle starts wide. But as more ants are drawn in by the strengthening chemical signal, it tightens. A whirlpool of unthinking bodies. They will follow this circular path until their energy reserves are spent. Until they collapse from sheer exhaustion. Their greatest strength, that blind, perfect obedience, has become their executioner. There is no individual ant capable of descent, of seeing the larger, insane pattern and simply stepping away. Their system has no capacity for rebellion and therefore no mechanism for self-correction. In this small, tragic circle of dying insects, you see a terrifyingly familiar shape. You see the echo of our own doomed systems, of bureaucratic procedures followed long after their purpose has vanished of financial algorithms spiraling into market collapse, of ideological certainties that demand we march in lockstep, even towards a cliff. The ant mill is nature's most brutal metaphor for the dangers of unchecked obedience. It is a physical manifestation of a flawed idea followed to its logical and lethal conclusion. The superorganism, in all its power, marches on oblivious to this small failure. But here, in this quiet corner of the jungle, you see the ultimate price of its perfection. The opposite of chaos isn't always order. Sometimes, it's a sterile, clockwork madness that marches perfectly until it dies. We step back from the microcosm, the frantic, rustling sounds of the jungle floor softening as we return to our own scale the journey into the heart of the superorganism has shown us a different model of existence. A world without individuals, without choice, without ego. Yet one that achieves a terrifying and undeniable success. We saw cities made of flesh and a queen who was a slave to her own throne. We left our world to find truths in the small, only to discover a chilling reflection of ourselves. And so we are left with one final, unsettling question as our own human systems grow ever more complex and interconnected. Which invisible trails are we following blindly? And where, precisely, does our circle end? <laughs>